Hello one and all and welcome to the Math Magic Show and this one we're going to take a look at walking through the Delta Epsilon definition of a limit. Let's take a look here. So here is a piece of the graph of the following function 2 over x. Now when you look at this function, let's make an observation here. Here is the observation that the limit as x approaches 1 can be found simply through direct substitution because as you can see you can replace x with 1 and that gives you 2. So this 2 that you see right there that's the value of the function, it's also pretty much the limit as x approaches 1. So here's a common question. If you look down from the vertical to the horizontal down below, you might ask, how close should the inputs be to the value 1 so that the outputs are within a certain range of the limit, which is 2? So in other words, how should we select values around the x-axis, around the x equals 1 specifically, so that the outputs around here are within a certain range close to 2. That's our goal. We're going to do a lot of math to achieve this and take a look at the results. So, as a first step, arbitrarily what I'm going to do is just decide that I want the upper limit to be 2.2, so that's 2 tenths above the 2, and the lower one I'm going to call the following, 1.8, so that's 0.2 below that limit of 2. And I want to, the outputs to stay within this range. So, let's take a look. First, we're just going to do this kind of visually, just so we can understand and build up our intuition of what we are actually doing before we get to the math, otherwise the math will just get in the way. So take a look. If I map back from the vertical to the horizontal, it's going to look like that brown arrow that hits the graph. And then after that, you see it goes down to the x-axis. So that value on the bottom right there, that's slightly to the left of the 1. Let's do this for the 1.8 from the vertical. So you see that maps back to the separate value on the x-axis in that position. If you look carefully at these two, you see closely something the following is true, that there's slightly a wider gap. So from the 1 to the brownish arrow is a bit more narrow than from the 1 to the black arrow. That gap is a little bit bigger. Obviously there has to be a reason for that. It's not just arbitrary or kind of random. And the reason for that is if you look here, you see this line, it's really due to the slope. The slope is kind of key in a lot of this stuff. So that's the origin of like the slightly different spacing. But that's all I want to say about that. What we really want to do is, how do we find these values down below? For example, very concretely and exactly, where does the brown arrow hit and the black arrow hit the x-axis down below? Because that spacing between the arrows represents our range of x's. So we're going to do that as follows. We're going to apply the basic definition. So up here at step number one, I have absolute value of 2 over x minus 2 less than 0 0.2. What this says is the function 2 over x minus the limit of the function 2. I want that spacing to be less than 0 0.2. That 0 0.2 is not special, it's just a number I made up. It could be 0 0.1, it could in general be just, you know, for example, some letter like a or b. People will use epsilon, as you might know. So now let's take a look, go through the stages of solving this inequality. So because it's an absolute value inequality at stage 2, what you do essentially is you drop the bars and then you put the negative 0 0.2 on the, on the left and then 0 0.2 positive stays on the right. You drop the bars and you rewrite it as this kind of inequality. The next goal is to solve this. So let's go through the process of solving this. Well, one thing that you can do is you can add 2 to both sides. And that's going to give you that 2x now is between those values. If you look at step number 3 and the picture that I have, that's pretty much the same idea. Think about it for a sec. If you look at step 3 and if you look at the picture to my left here, see they kind of go together very well. Everything in math always means something. Every single step that you write, not just the final answer, but every single little step carries information. If you take the, exa if you take the time to examine it, you'll discover things you might not see otherwise. At the last step, we have 1.8, less than 2 over x, less than 2.2. So again, step number 4 says that we want 2 over x, the outputs from the function, to be trapped between 1.8 and 2.2. These are inequalities here from 1, 2, 3, and 4 that are all talking about the y-axis, what's happening on the y-axis. Now we have to go from that and somehow transform it so it gives us a relevant fact about what happens on the x-axis. That's our next goal here. Can we transform information that describes the y-axis into information that describes the x-axis? And we can do that simply through manipulating these inequalities. So take a look at the next step here. 
First of all, what I'm doing is just flipping the inequality. So instead of writing 1.8 at 5, I wrote 1 over 1.8. 1.8 is really 1.8 over 1. So when you flip it, it becomes 1 over 1.8. In the middle where it says 2 over x, that's really x over 2 now in the middle. And for the last part where it says 2.2, that's really 2.2 over 1, so flipped it becomes 1 over 2.2. And the only adjustment we make here is that the direction of the inequality has to be switched at step number 5. Now think about this for a second, because it sometimes gets people, like why do you have to switch the direction of the inequality? Imagine here you have the numbers 1, 2, 3. So 1 is less than 2, and then 2 is less than 3. Imagine you accept that. 1 is less than 2, and 2 is less than 3. If you flip each of those values you would have 1 over 1 then you would have 1 over 2 and then you would have 1 over 3 so then one more time you would have 1 over 1 1 over 2 1 over 3 you have to flip the direction of the inequality because then now you would have to say that 1 is greater than 1 half which is greater than 1 third you see okay so the same logic applies at step number five here for exactly the same reason there's nothing magical or mysterious about it so next we want to get the x by itself so i multiply at step number six every term i see by two because at step number five you have a two in the bottom you multiply by two to clear all the fractions as usual so that's going to give me let's see here the next step that will look like this so the two and the two at step six cancel off that leaving only x in the middle of step seven and then i have 2.1 over 1.8 multiply greater than 2.1 over 2.2 and so on now this inequality is cleaned up a little bit so that's going to give you that 1.11 1 is greater than x which is greater than 0 0.91 and this is a fine way of writing this inequality but it perhaps is not the most natural way usually because of the way we've been taught we arrange values so the smaller is on the left and the bigger is on the right so at step number eight i'm going to transition to nine simply by doing this take a look it's going to look like I'm going to f rotate the inequality. So it becomes 0 0.91 less than x less than 1.11. It's an equivalent statement. 8 and 9 look different to the i, but they're not. Okay, they mean exactly the same thing. Let's depict, say, step number 9 on a number line. So what does that look like? Think about this for a second. So you have a number line, you mark your 1 in the middle. So where is that 1 in the middle coming from? Right here. That one in the middle is present because remember that is right here. You see this? As x approaches one, that's the limit. And it's also in the picture, you see the one is in the middle there between the arrows. So that's why over here I have one in the middle. And then to the left I have 0 0.91 and to the right I have 1.11. Now I hope you observe something about this interval of values. These are the allowed values of x that you can stick in. So in other words, like if you took a value like say 1.01, .01, and you stuck it into, for example, the function, the output would be guaranteed to be between 2.2 and 1.8 on the vertical. That's what we have found. That's what this tells us. But is that everything? Not really. Take a look. There's a sort of detail that we have to discuss still. Okay, so I've moved on, and this is the same picture. The only difference is up here I've cleaned up so it looks a bit more clean and I made the solid arrows into dashed arrows so now let's take a look we have to answer some additional questions when I look at this picture on my left side here I hope you see something that there's a problem with the gap sizes what problem is there it's a fundamental question notice that this says 0.09 in other words 1 minus 0.91 will give you a gap of 0.09 that's a way to think about it and if you do 1.11 minus one is going to give you a gap of 0 0.11. Now we're doing the epsilon delta definition, don't forget that. So in the first one we saw that the epsilon is the basically 0.2. It's the spacing between the value of 2 over here and then the 2.2 or the 1.8. So our epsilon is 0.2. But here you solve this inequality and the issue is you get two different values of spacings. You have to decide which is the correct one because that then gives you the delta that you need. So we have to investigate a little bit beyond what we just see here. Let's take a look at the next step, therefore. So we'll have the following. I'm going to take this one. I'm going to say that an absolute value, x minus 1, it should be less than 0 0.09. In other words, the smaller of the gaps. That's usually how this works. You take the smaller of the gaps. But let's see what the reasons might be if we try to take the bigger of the gaps. Let's draw a picture here first. So the picture will look like this. This is the picture for the current one. I'm choosing 0 0.09 as my delta, essentially. That's what I'm saying here, okay? I will have the following. So I have 1 is in the middle, then I have 0 0.91 on the left, 1.09 on the right, and the knee spacing is equal there, as you can see, to 0 0.09. So that's my first delta. This is the good delta, but let's see why the 
0.11 from up here if I try to use this one right here 0.11 why well, that would be the bad delta we gotta understand that so at the next stage let's continue here down below I'm gonna say x minus 1 in absolute value is less than 0.11 this one's no good let's draw a picture here and we have to study up on the picture a little bit to see what happens in the picture so this is the breakdown right you have 1.1 on the right you have 0 0.89 on the left, we have 1 in the middle, and then you have, for that reason, 0 0.9 as a possible value. So what is the issue with that possible 0 0.9? I'm assuming that my delta is 0 0.11, so that goes from 1 all the way to 0 0.89 on the left. And that means 0 0.9 is included as in this set of values. But is there a consequence to having 0 0.9 as an included value that you can input into the function? There is a very specific one, take a look. And of course, there's nothing special about using 0.9 to illustrate. I just needed some value within this range of 0.11 to the left and right of 1. So let's go over to the picture here, take a look on this side, and then scroll down to the bottom. I'm going to try to plug 0.9 into the function, and you will see what happens in terms of the output. That will be the key step to understanding why the delta has to be chosen just so. So when I do that here, look, see there's an arrow that has appeared. Let's go through that arrow a little bit down below, okay? So it goes from 0.9, and if you go all the way up, you see it takes you to here, bounces off the curve essentially, but then the issue is that it outputs above 2.2. So if 0.9 goes in, which would be an accepted value within a delta using 0.11, that would give you an output above the 2.2, which is our maximum for the upper range down on the y-axis. So that 0.9 is no good for that reason. Which means that the delta that allows that 0.11 is also no good. I hope you've got that subtle detail down. So how can we fix this, so to speak? We can fix this simply by taking the smaller of the two deltas. In other words, we're going to fix it by taking 0.09 as the delta. It's the smaller of the two possible gaps that's solving our inequality produced. Back here next, I guess on my left side, okay? Or my right side. <laughs> I can't tell because everything's reversed. <laughs> Okay, let's be serious and move on. So, let's stress this as follows. Down below, I'm going to add some additional details. Okay, let me add them and I'll zoom in on them and talk about them a bit more. So it looks like this right here. Look at this picture. So what it's saying is that the 0.9, which would be allowed by the delta of 0.11, is not good. Which implies that the smaller delta of 0.09 is the one that we are going to take. So in other words... Our values of x that are acceptable would be centered at 1, just the way this picture appears to be centered at 1. It would go to the left to 0.91 and then on the right side to 1.09. So this narrow range of values would be the acceptable range of inputs. As you can see, this aspect of calculus and limits and so on is quite subtle, and things are not necessarily obvious. They have to be investigated with great care. <laughs> Let's finally finish this up. What it's telling us, therefore, is the following, that for the value 2 over x minus 2 to be at a spacing of 0.2 less than that specifically, right? Then the inputs, in other words, the difference between the input value of x and 1 has to be less than 0.09 for the reasons that I've shown you. In other words, that 0.09 is the smaller of the two possible gaps that we got here when we just solved our inequality step by step by step. And that is it for me. Thank you so much for watching. Please leave a like and subscribe. And I'll see you in another mathematical video.